In the year that Alcard and Skinner was decided by the Court of Appeal, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show came to London and Queen Victoria was celebrating her Golden Jubilee. This case, Alcard and Skinner, is one of my favourites because it helped me to understand the breadth and adaptability of the equitable doctrine of undue influence. Our story is a type of coming of age tale concerning a young unmarried woman by the name of Miss Alcard. If she were in a plot of, of a Victorian novel, think Anthony Trollope meets Henry James. Indeed, if Henry James hadn't already written his great masterpiece six years earlier, he could have written this story and still have called it a portrait of a lady. Miss Alcard became a nun, but the road she travelled was not a smooth one. You will seek in vain for a cast of dastardly characters in this case, even though the defendant was called Miss Skinner, a name with an obviously sinister undertone, and the other chief protagonist was a man called the Reverend Nihill. But you won't really find a single real villain. If this case were an episode of Friends, it would be called the one where nobody really does anything wrong. Well, our story begins in Finsbury in 1868, by which time Miss Alcard was a person of no small means, her father having died some years previously. In addition to an income under his will, she was due to receive a large capital sum as soon as the youngest of her siblings attained 25. She by then was in her late twenties, unmarried and still living at home. The judgments refer to certain difficulties in her home life. What these were remain unclear, but I suspect a certain malaise had crept in. There she was, still stuck at home, lacking in purpose and occupation and finding no appropriate outlet. Perhaps it was for this reason that she acquired a spiritual director and confessor, said Reverend Nihill, vicar of St. Michael's in Finsbury, and a wish to devote herself to good works. This clergyman in due course introduced Miss Alcard to Miss Skinner, the lady superior of a small Protestant sisterhood called the Sisters of the Poor, committed to doing good works for charity. After a while, Miss Alcard became a professed member of the sisterhood and bound herself to observe the rules of chastity, poverty and obedience. The second of which enjoined the absolute giving up of all individual property, not necessarily by making a gift to the sisterhood, although that would of course be most welcome. Next, Miss Alcard made a will, leaving all her property to Miss Skinner and the sisterhood. And over the course of the next five years, she divested herself of the greater part of her inherited fortune in favor of the sisterhood. But her time with the sisterhood was not destined to last. In 1879, she cut her ties and joined the Roman Catholic Church instead. She revoked her will and belatedly asked for her money back, most of which had been spent. If Miss Skinner's hadn't, answer hadn't been no, of course, I wouldn't be telling this story. Miss Alcard brought proceedings, claiming that she had been induced to make gifts whilst acting under the influence of Miss Skinner, without any separate or independent advice. Miss Alcard lost at first instance before Mr Justice Kekowich, and in the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Lindley picked out a number of examples of Miss Skinner's spiritual dominance over Miss Alcard, but he found no deception, no unfair advantage, and no pressure other than the strictness of the spiritual vows Miss Alcard had been obliged to make. He also found that not a farthing of Miss Alcard's money had been applied for the private benefit of Miss Skinner or the Reverend. Nonetheless, and but for a successful defence of late cheese and acquiescence, Miss Alcard would have succeeded in her claim. The judge said this, I believe that in this case there was in fact no unfair or undue influence brought to bear upon the plaintiff, other than such as inevitably resulted from the training she had received, the promise she had made, the vows she had taken, and the rules to which she admitted her, had submitted herself but her gifts were in fact made under a pressure which, whilst it lasted, the plaintiff could not resist. She was absolutely in the power of the Lady Superior and the Reverend Nihill. A gift made by her under these circumstances cannot be retained. And here's the line I always remember. The influence of one mind over another is very subtle, and of all influences, religious influence is the most dangerous and the most powerful and to counteract it, courts of equity have gone very far.